It's not for being my well-being, but for any being on the planet to be in need just shouldn't be. The laws of equilibrium dictate that the political economy will not equilibrate till the wages in Africa are at par with the wages here. Hi, I'm Paul Duchesne. Welcome to Mama Paul's video podcast. Today is Tuesday, Tuesday, June the 29th, 2021. We're going to mix things up a little bit, and uh, instead of doing a straight news-only half-hour show, I'm going to mix up a little bit and put a little poetry in there. This was, the, this was how I used to open the show. Years ago, I, I originally did the show back after uh, 9-11, and it was poetry, politics, and tea. I would open up with a poem that I wrote. I would end with a poem that somebody else wrote. Uh, in between, I would do news, and I would interview a woman working on world peace. Well, as I'm doing the show all my own with uh, my own camera and doing my own editing, etc., uh, we've had to uh, reduce the content and uh, keep it uh, a little bit more minimalized. So anyway, this was a poem that I had written, and you'll notice, um, if not for being my well-being, but for any being on the planet, to be in need just shouldn't be. The laws of equilibrium dictate that the political economy will not equilibrate till the wages in Africa are at par with the wages here. What that's saying is that as long as you have a world economy, you're going to have a world market for labor, a world market for, for, for merchandise, a world market for land. And this whole world market thing sort of started with the beginnings of capitalism back in the 1600s. But it wasn't until like 1970s that the internal corporations in, in specifically in America and a couple in France and England, started to become transnational or multinational as we know them today. The term back in the 60s and 70s was transnational. So it's at this point that the companies realized, well, if we move our production overseas, instead of paying somebody 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars an hour, we can pay them, you know, five, ten bucks an hour, maybe even less. So if we reduce that labor cost, we can make more money for ourselves. And that's sort of what's been going on ever since this whole thing started in the, uh, literally in the early 70s, late, late 60s, early 70s, this whole process started. And the pay rate in America will not equilibrate till the wages in Africa are at the par with the wages here. And what we're saying is until we have an e egalitarian world labor market, the forces who are looking to hire the labor are going to go as far away as they can for the cheapest labor possible whenever whenever they can. The system is not built on human rights, the system is built on corporate rights. Now originally, when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, he intended, he intended the whole concept being that it was going to raise the wealth of everybody in the nation. So everybody who was consuming, all the consumers in a consumer society would benefit from them. And on and off, it's been like that, on and off. We've gone through a couple of periods of extreme inequality, and right now, we are in a period of an inequality that makes the French Revolution look like child's play. That was the original poem we wrote a long time ago, back in 2000, right after 9-11. And I started writing uh, about six months before 9-11, and maybe a year after. I could feel 9-11 coming. And it started with Timothy McVeigh and the bombing of the uh, in Oklahoma. And suddenly stuff just started coming out of me. I don't know where it was even coming out of me, but stuff started coming out of me. I wrote dozens and dozens and dozens of pages of things. Uh, many of them you've heard. Uh, some of them you haven't. And uh, the America is a Shopping Bag was a favorite of mine back then. And uh, I just ran into it the other day. That is the original poster. So this is after 9-11, a few months later, it was time for the American, everybody stopped doing everything. Everybody was in a frozen state, shopping, everything stopped. And people stopped buying things they didn't need for sure. So this went on for a few months. And sometime later in the fall, I think it was around, let's see, September, October, November, I think late November, early December, this poster was commissioned and it was done by an artist in Mill Valley of all places. And it was America Open for Business with an American flag shopping bag and my wife actually bought merchandise from a, a clothing company in Monterey and they sent it in the American flag shopping bag and this other poster here 
they added a dollar sign to the S and 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 they highlighted in sin as sin uh, business B U S I N. The word sin is highlighted with the uh, with the hash the hash marks on the S and the flag has the zeros and ones uh, in where the uh, stars and stripes would go and the sh where the stars would go and the stripes are these red and dark blue uh, missiles. So this was sort of a, a group that went one step further. The group is Truth.Now. That's who put out that little poster, if you're interested. But anyway, the poem is called America is a, a Shopping Bag. I've got a poster to prove it. America, open for business with an American flag shopping bag. What has not changed, we are asked. Morgan Stanley, we are told. If we keep consuming in spite of the null and overcome terror by buying some swell merchandise is what we need more of. George Carlin stuff to fill our garages up. Social needs as measurements of greed is how the ruling class remains intact, telling us we too can abuse those under us. Social needs as a measurement of greed. And this was the line that, that jumped out at me when I wrote this in the first place. And the concept is that the people on top are always trying to keep the people at the bottom oppressed. And if they can get the middle people to do the oppression, then they're way ahead of themselves. And in most cases, this is exactly what they've tried to do. They're trying to pit the middle class against the lower class. And this thing became really apparent and an eyesore, practically, with the whole um, $300 that was added uh, to the unemployment checks. This whole concept of essential workers, which have been the denigrated people in the society for years. Well, suddenly the essential workers became essential when the pandemic started. As the Richie Riches uh, closed up their little apartments in Manhattan and went out to their summer homes in the Hamptons, in fact, there was, a, there was a, a post, there was a, a chart at one point showing where all the rich people from Manhattan had left. Uh, the majority went out to the island, a lot went down south, went up north to New England, other places. But they, they broke the whole thing down. But a big majority went out to, out to the end of Long Island, the eastern end of Long Island where the Hamptons are. And I'm going to get to uh, a follow-up on that uh, at the end here. But social needs is a measurement of greed. So... If we can keep us looking at the lower class people as as crooks, as, as scam artists, that people who are trying to game the system, then the people in the middle will be opposed to them they'll, because they'll feel like they're getting ripped off. Well, they came up with the concept of a welfare queen. So you wind up with one person who may be gaming the system out of a hundred. So that one person became known as a welfare queen. And this term was extensively used in the 80s and it was adopted by Ronald Reagan and the whole that whole 80s era in order to denigrate those lower class people and keep the middle class oppressing them social needs as a measurement of grief. so the idea that they should uh, be able to pay for their rent and their food and their clothing and send their kids to school was like oh my god these greedy people how could they want so much well the people that are calling them greedy are this top 1%, the top 1% of 1%, or even the top 10%. When you get into who who is gaming the system, if you take a look at this, you're going to find that 80% of those people in these upper brackets are gaming the system, and much less people in the lower realms are gaming the system. And the amount of gaming that they're getting is minimal compared to what's going on up at the upper end. Now, in the midst of this, we got this $300 a week um, extra bonus to keep these people so that they can pay the rent, feed the kids, and maybe, uh, you know, get some medical attention taken care of. $300 a week, uh, 50 weeks in the year. Okay, so we got 300 times 50, so we one, two, three, so we got 15. Fifth, one, two, three, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. Now, I don't know if you've taken a look at things recently, but... I think the minimum amount of money that you need to be able to afford to live, say, in the Bay Area, is somewhere around forty thousand dollars. Forty thousand is your is your um, baseline minimum. You cannot survive without it. So, if you're getting an extra uh, fifteen thousand dollars a year, 
that's not going to do it. You need to be in the forty-five thousand dollar a year category. So if you ha if your unemployment is less than three hundred, we'll add that to it. You're going to be barely holding on. So the the people that are scraping at the bottom that are barely holding on are the people we want to get these essential workers back to work. So when the whole pandemic started to ease off and people started coming back to work, we noticed a glut of 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 uh, openings for the job that people weren't responding to. The essential worker, the people that pick the food, deliver the food, cook the food, sell it to you in the store, the people that are in the hospitals taking care of you, the people that are doing the maintenance, the people that are driving the cars, the essential workers out there are not making enough money. There's been a huge disparity and it has been growing since the beginning of this whole multinational movement which started like I said in the late 60s early 70s this whole multinational movement these corporations are making much more money than they were making they're raising the overall the whole income of the whole country but are the workers getting it no the workers aren't getting it it's all going to the top and there's people that are literally some managers are literally running the co companies into the ground, borrowing money from them. Well, you've seen this on the, uh, the movie Wall Street. Really clearly identified the problem of how these mergers and acquisitions work. And I have people in my family that are involved with mergers and acquisitions. And uh, it's uh, basically uh, disgusting what's going on. The uh, high-end people are reaping uh, all the wealth, and the low-end people are getting crushed right and left. Uh, let me bring you over to a little headline over here, and I can, I can probably get the actual headline up. Um, yeah, there it is. Desperate for help in the Hamptons. Desperate. Desperate for help in the Hamptons. Well, <laughs> that's uh, shocking to me that they're desperate for help in the Hamptons, but they are. And the, the picture, when I looked at this picture over here, let's, uh, well, I can bring me into it too. When I'm doing it. Uh, you look at this picture there. All the little Richie Riches are sitting out here enjoying their little uh, meal that's starting, and here's all the wait people and the wait people. They job openings only if workers can afford the rent. So what, it's so bad out in the Hamptons that what they're going to do is they're going to give them a three dollar an hour increase. Okay. So we're going to give them a three. So instead of fifteen an hour, we're going to move them up to eighteen dollars an hour. Whoopie do! Uh, meanwhile, uh, the guy that's sitting at the table there, if he's making less than two hundred and fifty dollars an hour, I'll be shocked. I'll be really shocked. More than likely, most of the people sitting at these tables are making at least two fifty an hour, and I, I, I'm not kidding around. So they're going to get a three dollar an hour increase times twenty hours a week. So oh, sixty dollars, six twelve, eighteen, oh, two hundred and forty dollars a month. Wow. Uh, take taxes off, so maybe two hundred. So we're going to give them an increase. They can make an extra two hundred dollars a month. I can't believe why they would uh, not rush to the job. I've said this in the past. We ought to be paying uh, the people that pick the food fifty dollars an hour, and the bankers. We ought to be paying them twenty dollars an hour. The system needs to be turned on its head. It's driven by dollars, and it needs to be dri it needs to be driven by a human condition. And the other, uh, I'll just run over the the other board here for a second. The other thing I had put up last week was the uh, <coughs> the capitalism and democracy thing. Uh, let me get rid of that. Uh, select and yes, okay, that's gone. And I had, this is the main thesis that I'm sort of working with, that we right now, our political economy right now needs to evolve. And we need to move into a spiritual political economy. And by spiritual, I simply mean that we are looking at our deeper selves and we are all in this together. And there's an egalitarianness among all of us on the planet. We on the planet are planetary citizens and we are all in this together. And that's the spirituality I'm talking about, not the, uh, not the uh, desert religion um, obfuscation which has been going on lately. But the main thesis I'm working on is that the democracy and the capitalism, which are codependent on each other and driven by religious beliefs, 
this whole system is in a state of collapse. And as something collapses, a new thing emerges. And the new emergence, I think, is what I call uh, <coughs> the, the spiritual political economy. The spiritual part is the mindfulness. The political part is the equality and the hashtag Me Too movement. And the economic part is more of a cooperative nature. I think that's where we're going. And my goal will be to present both sides of the picture to show what I see as the collapsing parts of the society and the new parts that are growing in the society. That's my whole emphasis. I've been a political economy person since uh, college, so that's why I keep going back to this, uh, this theme, and it's why I talk about the capitalism and democracy, and I talk about our history. So today I wanted to give you the two poems America is a shopping bag, and uh, it's not for being my well-being. Just to do something a little bit different, shake it up a little bit, and uh, try a few new approaches to this thing. I'm going to try to get uh, five shows out a week. It's my goal. Uh, four of them will be um, talk shows down here in the studio, and one of them will be a food show. So hopefully we'll do a food show tomorrow, get back on track here, and if my schedule stays like I hope it does... Peace, patience, and we'll see you soon. Persistence is the key.